<laughs> for the time at varanasi probably tomorrow morning will be else jayanthan <laughs> sorry for interruption so now it's uh, time to go live so it's 3 2 1 uh, we are live now sir over to you okay good evening friends on behalf of the tamil nadu ophthalmic association welcoming all for this tnoa yc ஜன் <laughs> and this tnoa arc pg catalyst master class which has been spearheaded by our chairman arc dr raj cheka has become a huge success among the post graduates and the residents this is the seventh master class every subspecialty of ophthalmology has been covered starting from cornea optoplastic glaucoma and every other specialty as well retina and uh, uh, i'm very happy to have the two stalwarts in pediatric ophthalmology one is uh, the two masters i would say Dr. Ramesh Rajshekaran, the son of the soil from Tamil Nadu, Trichy, who doesn't require any introduction. And of course, the gold standard of pediatric ophthalmology and stubsmology, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, formerly of Ames and now with the Center for Sight. And thank you very much, sir, for being with, uh, with us and honoring us. And also, it's a great, uh, uh, what do you call, honor and privilege to have uh, you on board for this TNOA Masterclass. TNOA has been uh, very much in activity. and uh, not only in the field of uh, what you call the uh, 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 giving uh, the academics but also uh, in the uh, for the cases as well which is on the last sunday of every month and the walk the talk series which has again become a very famous uh, a very very well appreciated very popular program wherein we are <coughs> interviewing the luminaries of tamil nadu ophthalmic association last week we have none other than uh, dr madhyawan and natrajan as a walk the top luminary and it was a real pleasure to listen to his story success story which really inspired rejuvenated and motivated all of us the tenure way connect series connects the major institutions across tamil nadu and mainly for the practicing of the malls but also for the post graduates which is conducted every last sunday apart from that we have got many other schemes as well many other projects as well which is going on full swing in tamil nadu i'm very thankful to my entire team for having a uh, restore the confidence on me and which is uh, we, we, uh, by which we are able to take tnoa to a greater greater level and to a different level all together this year <clears throat> also i would like to uh, uh, bring up uh, acknowledge the efforts of all our uh, office uh, parents the president elect the vice president the secretary the treasurer all other members of the management committee this master class of course has been charged by the moderated by dr raj shekar chairman of arc who has been really an impact i would call him a dynamite not a dynamic and again i would like to say that the tnoa mid year meet which is called the which is called the galata was a huge success which was held about 3 weeks back uh, uh, at uh, ideal beach resort at mahabalipuram wherein we had the wonderful opportunity of felicitating all the past presidents of the TNOA with the pride of TNOA award <clears throat> with these few words i hand over the proceedings to our president elect dr ramakrishnan to say a few words and then to dr sagar the dr madhavan our secretary of tnoa dr ramakrishnan sir hey, thank you thank you president uh, respected uh, president <laughs> dr mohan rajan secretary madhavan and uh, arc uh, chairman dr rajesh shekar and uh, my dear colleagues and uh, the respected uh, faculty of the today session dr pradeep sharma and uh, dr mo ramesh a warm good evening to all of you as uh, pointed out by your president uh, tamil nadu ophthalmic association is doing wonderful uh, uh, academic activities for the past 7 years uh, with so many um, different types of uh, academic programs and of course the today's program the 
the PG catalyst for purpose postgraduate especially is a very very uh, 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 innovative idea for our president and also it was most welcomed by all the PG throughout not only in Tamil Nadu and also all over the uh, country. It's a, such a, a wonderful uh, program. Uh, we have uh, conducted in so many other specialities like glaucoma, carnia. Uh, pediatric and uh, also other uh, acroplasty, etc. And today, of course, the pediatric ophthalmology uh, PG catalyst program. And uh, of course, I have to thank uh, the uh, AIC chairman, uh, Dr. Rajeshekhar, for choosing a, a two wonderful topic, the surgical topic in the pediatric ophthalmology, and also two uh, wonderful uh, faculty for uh, uh, this session. And also, I have to thank the moderator, the coordinator of the session, uh, Dr. Uh, James N. And of course, uh, no need to uh, introduce the speaker of the today, especially Dr. Rajiv Sharma, a, a very senior most pediatric ophthalmologist of our country, who, had, who headed the pediatric department at the RP Center. And uh, now he is the director of the pediatric ophthalmology at the Center for Sight in New Delhi. He's a, a definitely a wonderful person, and not only that, he is a very good in uh, pediatric ophthalmology. Anything, especially uh, the uh, uh, surgical aspect of uh, service was, is uh, uh, more than that. He is a wonderful teacher. I have heard about him from his students. Uh, such a nice uh, teacher, and uh, uh, I'm very very happy to welcome Dr. Pradeep Sharma for this today. Uh, session on PG Catalyst, definitely it will be a boon for the uh, postgraduate too, because he is going to talk about the surgical pals and strabismus surgery with video. And also the next speaker, my own uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh from Mahatma Hospital, Pritchi, again a pediatric ophthalmologist doing a wonderful work. He is going to give a practical uh, tips in doing a congenital cataract surgery, which is also one of the important problems in the pediatric age group. So these two people are uh, now going to enlighten us. And once again, I thank the Raja Shigar and the President, uh, uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan, and also uh, the coordinator of this session, uh, Dr. Jayanthan, for uh, doing wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ramakrishnan, always uh, as uh, inspiring as ever. And, you know, you hit the nail on the head because... Pradeek Sharma is, I, I will tell you, is the colossus of uh, pediatric ophthalmology, I would say, because he is a fantastic teacher, clinician, great surgeon, very, very um, uh, blessed to have him. And blessed to be in the same era as Professor Pradeep Sharma. And uh, let's go on to Dr. Madhavan, the, uh, the dynamic secretary of TNW, to say a few words. Our dear President, Dr. Mohan Rajan, our President-elect, Dr. Ramakrishnan, our treasurer, Dr. Loganathan, and of course, as everybody has said, that our professor, Dr. Raj Seker, was spread a, spearheading the movement of ARC PG Catalyst throughout this year with this wonderful presentation, Dr. Raj Seker, sir, and the young managing committee member from Eero, Dr. Jayantan, and the two masters, Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir and my dear friend, Dr. R. Ramesh from Trichy. And all our PGs, PGs who are tuned in for Facebook and YouTube for this masterclass, <coughs> sorry, PNOAS, ERC, PG Catalyst, masterclass in pediatric ophthalmology. A warm welcome to you all. <coughs> in addition, our TNOA conference is round the corner in the month of August. And the abstract submission, last date is 10th of April. And I request all our PG students to submit their abstracts as early as possible and utilize this opportunity of the wonderful conference to be held, the 69th TNOA conference to be held in Coimbatore in the month of August. Thank you for the opportunity. Looking forward to your wonderful webinar today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Loganathan, for always the wonderful contribution and uh, 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 significant, uh, remarkable commitment to TNYA also for the past uh, so many years. And uh, Dr. Loganathan, our treasurer, who has been, I would say, a very uh, silent but very, very competent worker, 
to say a few words. The respected president, and respected teachers of the today the ARC meeting, and uh, other teachers and seniors, uh, good evening to one and all. So it's always nice to hear from president, always he encourages all the uh, team uh, members. And uh, especially today's master class, uh, sorry, so like Pradeep Sharma, sorry, is a master of master in pediatric ophthalmology, I would say. Way back to during PG time, two, 2003, he was operated in a, a flight where, we, where we, all of us went to witness the surgery at uh, the plate itself. So from that day, she was uh, teaching us in the pediatric of the establishment. And of course, uh, Ramesh from our own state. So we are all waiting for those master's class. So thank you, President ARC Chairman, sir, for uh, arranging these wonderful programs. Thank you, sir. Hey, uh, thanks, Logan Then, and I'll be failing in my duty if I don't acknowledge the support of uh, Milmet, uh, who been supporting this tooth and nail right from the beginning. Uh, especially Raju, Hitendra, the entire team of Milmet. Don't forget Megabrom and Glowai in a practice. <laughs> and, you know, uh, over to Dr. Raj Shekhar, Chairman of ARC, moderator of this meeting. Take over. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a huge arrival moment for TNOA ARC Masterclass Series. What other setting and what other uh, maestros we need in, in our midst for all our... Uh, postgraduate students and young learners community, this I think is the best way to engage them. And TNOA is doing it in a stupendous way. This is a brand and uh, we have huge followership on all social media platforms. Even these, this class, the postgraduates and learners can type in their queries and I and my co-moderator, Dr. Jayanthan will be voicing them to our esteemed panel and the pinnacle of today's uh, masterclass, I, I, I will say, is one, one doctor uh, who had been speaking to us pediatric ophthalmology from the day we joined ophthalmology. But yet we couldn't uh, understand it in the real essence. We read your books and uh, we have seen a lot of, we have attended a lot, lot of your uh, programs, but yet the, the awesome moment of you being in our midst and speaking to us really inspires. And I'm sure every, every youngster who is uh, uh, watching this program really will take that inspiration into his life and career. We welcome Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir, um, great and um, esteemed teacher in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus, heading the RP Center unit and now the director of Center for Sight. Sir will be speaking to us on his uh, most uh, uh, pet topic, evaluation of strabismus. I think he would have spoken this topic almost thousands of times. And uh, the essence of that topic, we will hear today from his own mouth and with his presence amidst us. The next speaker for the day is the hero of Trichy, Dr. Ramesh Rajasekharan, sir, from RPI on. Hospital. He will be speaking to us on congenital cataract management. What other better topic to choose for our postgraduates and young learners? Congenital cataract management. His, uh, I think anybody who speaks congenital cataract should have at least 20 years of experience beyond them, behind them, because you operate on these children and you see them as adolescents, then as young adults, and they come back to you and you see how your cataract and how your eye oils are shining in their eyes. I think that is near divine experience. And I'm sure Dr. Ramesh is one person who can vouch for the most number of such successful surgeries in young population. And from his experience and expertise, we are going to listen about practical approach towards congenital cataract management. So we have two stalwarts amidst us. And of course, we I have Dr. Jayanthan to help me. We, I and Jayanthan, really from the bottom of my heart, thank Dr. Mohan Rajan, our president, TNOA, Dr. Ramakrishnan, our president-elect TNOA, Dr. Madhavan, secretary, and Dr. Loganathan, treasurer, for giving this platform an opportunity. And uh, we sure 
will be doing more in our future programs and in this program we have come to a as i said an arrival moment where we are going to listen to none other than dr pradeep sharma who is amongst us to speak about evaluation of strabismus dr pradeep sharma sir over to you sir rakshika rakshika before uh, pradeep sharma starts i would like yeah. to inform pradeep sharma sir that we have started on under the initiative under tnoi sir which is called gurukulam tnoi yeah. last sunday was the first uh, uh, edition of that and uh, this sunday that is the 10th uh, day after tomorrow will be the second edition wherein 19 faculty and covering 26 topics from 8 to 1 on every sunday um, all sundays of april which has been spearheaded by dr chandrashekar and dr vr vijayaravan of kaimbatur so thank you very much sir over to dr pradeep sir Yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Mohan Rajan, the president of TNOA. Thank you, Dr. Raj Shekhar, Dr. Ramakrishnan, Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Madhavan, and all the uh, masters who are there in TNOA who are making this possible for me to be talking from Delhi and joining with you uh, in this master class. It's always a pleasure to get with these young. Uh, people who are interested in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus and that has been something which has always made me more and more interested in taking this why because uh, i say i have no financial disclosures but i have some interest in the system changing and our education system has been more by road people don't understand what they are doing and we have very young bright people coming in and who are changed into another species we need to understand this subject ocular motility as we talk about it is dealing with 12 extra ocular muscles and they are playing the game in the nine houses or the nine gazes of our eyes it's something similar to the 12 houses in the zodiac sign which are being disturbed by the nine planets in case of ophthalmology it is the nine houses which are disturbed by these 12 extra ocular muscles if they work in tandem then it is good but otherwise they'll create a misalignment and in in addition we have to deal with binocularity and that is happening because we have the two eyes seeing little differently and their uh, visual uh, inputs are then being collected in the occipital cortex uh, finally what happens is the right eye and the left eye ocular dominance columns are coming together they are initially monocular and then they become binocular and that's what gives us a binocularity uh, to understand just that each eye has a, a different visual direction in physical space but in the uh, brain we have a common visual direction which gives us a single percept just understand these terms there are two visual axes which are supposed to meet at the point of fixation or regard the two fovea share a common visual direction when they are not aligned then we call there is a squint or strabismus and whenever we are talking of binocular vision remember we are dealing with two eyes and the two fovea are supposed to correspond with each other and that is known as the normal retinal correspondence or or a foveo foveal correspondence all the other retinal points are having a point to point correspondence but that is all through which is variable when the foveal correspondence changes whenever these corresponding points are being stimulated we have a binocular single vision and no diplopia but whenever this doesn't happen and disparate points are stimulated there is going to be a diplopia uh, if we understand the concept of horopter it's like the ipd being separated and the two eyes are seeing around a circle and in the geometric concept it's known as the wieth muller circle or the geometric horopter but in actual practice we have a deviation that has been described by herring hillbrand and what we see actually is a more flatter horopter in front of us a little front and little behind this horopter is an area which is even though of disparity it allows fusion and that gives rise to stereopsis and that is known as a panums area so what is stereopsis now stereopsis is the hallmark of our two eyes seeing little differently and these small disparities within the panums fusional limits are fused and they give a 3d effect you may have all seen this and sometimes you can you can take a picture shot and try the focusing your eyes and seeing you will suddenly see a ball a pyramid and a cone all coming in a three dimensional effect we have two eyes and we know that the two eyes are an asset even in the lower animals it gives the two eyes which are peripherally placed a large field but in the higher animals like the human beings 
and it gives rise to stereopsis but remember any misalignment can create an asset becoming a liability if you have a lot of money you will be very proud of it but the moment the income tax officer comes or there is a demonetization there is a problem and that becomes a liability how to tackle that amount of money so any asset can become a liability by change of alignment so you need to be worried about that if it becomes a liability in case of strabismus it gives rise to an headache or asthenopia or eye strain a double vision confusion be between the two eyes seeing differently a past pointing a vertigo because of that and of course the psychosocial problem will be there how to take care of these bug bears is what is done by our adaptations and one of the motor adaptations is the head posture it's like turning away if you have a problem in front of you and you can avoid that problem so that is by a face turn to the right or left a chin up or chin down position or a head tilt to the right or left side like we see in these pictures and this is giving us the advantage of binocular t if if in the position in which the two eyes are still aligned so we may have a face turn to the right or left if there is a paralytic squint or a chin down position or a head tilt in this form on the other side we can have sensory adaptations in children in order to take care of the diplopia or double vision and that is by gradually suppressing the other image which is creating a problem if the image is in the uh, field of having a correspondence being regenerated then you can have a harmonious anomalous retinal correspondence now what is happening in the harmonious arc is that in the cortex itself there is a reconnection of the other closer areas which are giving a similar visual uh, perception and they can give rise to a harmonious arc this is possible up to eight prism diopters usually so if we just try to understand the social analogy it's like two strangers coming together if they have a normal uh, development with each other it gives rise to a normal harmonious marriage in the case of the eyes we are talking about the two eyes giving a normal binocular vision but if the two sides of of the ocular dominance columns keep on dominating uh, individually they keep on quarreling with each other they will lead to a separation or a divorce or on the other end if only one eye dominates it may give rise to a amblyopia so what is amblyopia to understand it's a developmental anomaly of vision we are not born with 6 by 6 vision when we are born we gradually acquire it it's like a cortex learning a new language and that is vision if you understand this concept you will always remember just like the uh, languages we learn best in the first 5 years of our life we may learn the language even later on but it is much more difficult so if you are born in tamil nadu for you learning tamil is very easy but if you are suddenly shifted from a new another place to tamil nadu you will learn it but with lot of difficulty really the vision can be acquired even later on so amblyopia can be corrected at any age with lot of effort but best corrected in the first 5 years of our life anything can cause amblyopia which is causing a stimulus deprivation in the form of high uncorrected refractive error or a cataract or media opacity which dr ramesh would be talking about any uh, unequal uncorrected refractive errors can create uh, an unequal Im uh, images to the two sides giving rise to amblyopia or of course the strabismus and nystagmus can give and sometimes there can be a mixed etiology which can cause this how do we assess now sensory assessment if you have a child who has a manifest squint if you just look at him he may be observing uh, you with just one eye and the other eye is squinting if you cover the squinting eye he will not react much but the moment you cover the good eye he would actually revolt he doesn't want the good eye to be obstructing the vision so this is a very simple test the fixation preference test you cover the eye alternately and if you find that he tolerates one eye but does not tolerate the coverage of the other eye it implies that the eye other eye has got a very poor vision so the fixation preference test can be done now this child if you see here he is having an alternation he is looking with the right eye in the upper picture and the left eye in the lower picture because that is his better eye and he is cross fixating you can induce a squint by 10 prism diopter prism and see which eye he prefers to fixate a cross fixation implies that both the eyes are having equal vision then you look into the eye and see if it's a central steady or maintained fixation whether he is following the eye movements horizontally or vertically this will directly tell you that the child 
has vision and how, what is the level of his qualitative vision. Always use fixation devices which are child friendly in the form of toys and have multiple toys because the attention span of a child is short. So you can just check the eye vision with the help of these toys or fixation devices or a television working at a distance. When you have a very small child, you may use your ophthalmoscope to shine the light on the eyes with the larger aperture and you will see the Bruckner's fundus reflex. Now, what is Bruckner's fundus reflex? You will see that the eye which is having a misalignment is having a much brighter reflex. And this is also the basis of photo screeners. And it may also indirectly tell you if there is a large refractive error in the eyes in addition to the squint. If we have to test the vision in infants, we may have to be a little more alert. The child has to be alert, not hungry, not well fed, but at the same time, the examiner also should be gentle, friendly, observant, and not very hungry, nor well fed. We need to be a little attentive. The tests can be in the theoretical form, we may say they may be uh, mentioned as detection equity tests, resolution equity tests, or the recognition equity tests. For amblyopia testing, the best are the recognition equity tests, which we'll talk about some uh, now in this. Now, vision screening as described by American Academy of Ophthalmology and American Acad Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Now, this chart is something which is very useful. You can take a picture shot of this. From birth to six months, a simple screening test can be looking for a red reflex test, the Bruckner's reflex, the corneal light reflex test, or the external examination to see any structural defects in the form of ptosis, or if there is a media opacity in the form of a cataract or corneal opacity you know that there is going to be a problem and these are amblyopogenic. Seven to 12 months, you can also see the uh, preference of fixation of the eyes as well as the fixation and follow movements that we talked about. And one to five years, we will have some other tests which will be possible to do. Now, one of them is the teller equity cards in which the child is shown a, pref uh, a pattern on one side and a blank on the other, which is space average luminance gray. So if he is shown a pattern, he will always look at the pattern and we keep on changing these patterns to smaller and smaller resolution sizes, gratings, and we will finally be able to see which is the finest grating that he can perceive and that will tell us how much is the visual activity. A child around 11 or 12 months of age normally also will not have better than 6 by 24 vision. But if he has a refractive error or a media opacity or a, a squint, the vision declines as shown in these bar diagrams you'll see that the vision drops to almost like 6 by 2000 if there is a, a media opacity more than 3 millimeters. We can also use candy beads to test the visual equity of a child or use an optokinetic drum, which will tell us that there is a movement which is there if he's able to see those gratings. Uh, a cat foot drum is another test which has been used, but generally what we mostly use is the teller equity cards for up to 18 months. And for the uh, children who are up to three years, we may use the vanishing optotypes or the Cardiff equity cards test. Now, this is showing you an optotype which is visible to the child at a particular distance. It becomes blurred if it is uh, more than that distance or his visual equity is poorer. Again, we can see the visual equity of the children affected by a refractive error or a strabismus or a media opacity. So one to two years age, what will you do? You will look for teller equity cards or the Cardiff equity cards, or you can use the boy candy bead test. Children who are two to three years, you may use the language skills and show them pictures and ask them to identify. Now, this is like different optotypes are shown and we can check. The LIA symbols are the most uh, useful ones because they are uh, to be seen by any child uh, in the form of shapes. And even if the child cannot name them, you can show him a, uh, a template close to him and ask him to identify a similar uh, symbol that he's seeing from distance. The Sheridan Gardner tests are the letter checks uh, looking from the same manner. Three to five years age, we can use the visual equity by testing the tumbling E or the letter charts at distance or for near. So these you are all familiar and we may not go into more details here, but just to remember, it has to be an age appropriate vision testing in children. Uh, three to 18 months, the preferential looking test like the Teller or the Keeler's cards. 12 to 30 months, the vanishing optotypes, Cardiff cards. Two to four years, the picture matching Case and Elliot's cards. And three to five years, single letter cards can be used. And four years and onward, you can use the linear silence or the Logmar Bailey-Lavie test. 
Now, testing the binocular vision or binocular perception, we can use the Bagolni striated glasses, which is shown on the left hand side. And these are simple striations on the glass and which will change a light into a form of line. And a child is shown uh, first in one eye and then the other eye. And then he's asked with both the eyes, what does he see? If he sees a cross response, it means that there is either a normal retinal correspondence or in the presence of a squint, if he still sees a cross, it means it's a harmonious ARC along with that squint. Or if he only sees one line, it would imply there is a suppression in the other eye. Similarly, the red and green goggles can be put on and you can show the worth four dot test to look for binocular vision perception or any suppression that is there. Testing the stereopsis is probably the most useful thing that we have to do. And these can be by the help of the Rendot test or uh, the TNO test. My preference is usually the TNO test with red and green glasses because these are more sturdy and they are more uh, dependable in testing the stereopsis. But a simple test which can be done for any child is the Lang's two pencil test. Hold a pencil in your hand and ask the child to play a game by touching the tip to the tip. And if he's seeing with both the eyes and has both the eyes functional, then only he can do this test. Otherwise, if you cover one eye, he will not be able to match the tip to tip. And it is a very good test for gross stereopsis. For distance stereopsis, of course, you have the uh, Frisbee Davis distance test in some of the centers or and the distance Randot test. You can also assess the contrast sensitivity, which may also give you some additional information. Coming to the motor test, we will talk about the various types of squints and we need to tame the terrible. How do we do it? My simple recipe that I usually talk about is based on this five pronged approach, observe, confirm, infer, plan and execute. So uh, you should have a good observation because child may not give you a lot of attention uh, time. And then you have to do a short confirmation test, then infer, plan and execute. Now we have talked about earlier that we have to deal with the nine houses that we are and in different positions, we'll have to assess for the visual uh, equity as well as the motor misalignment. Now look at this child. If he has an appearance of a squint, now is it a true squint in the upper picture? Many of the times one may fall in this trap that it appears to be an esotropia, but it is actually a pseudo isotropia. Why? Because the eyes are appearing to be ego because of a telecanthus or a large uh, width of the nasal bridge, but actually both the coronary reflexes are centered. So if you, if you do a cover test, you can easily confirm that this is not a true squint, but a pseudo strabismus. In the middle picture, you see another example of a pseudo isotropia because of a large palpebral aperture, the Uri blephron, or you may see like in the lower down picture, a pseudo exotropia because of a large angle kappa. This may also happen if you have a ROP sequelae in which the macula has been dragged. So you do a simple cover test and you can do it with your just covering the fingers and you'll know. Now, this is how we'll see in a video that this child appears to have a squint in the left eye. You cover the right eye and the left eye moves out. And we are sure that, yes, this is a true squint isotropia. Now, this is looking for a cover uncover test. Both the eyes appear to be straight initially. And now when I covered, the eyes had moved out. Now look again. Eyes had drifted out and then they rejoined. Now you notice two things here. One is behind the cover, the eye is moving out. Secondly, you notice what is the time taken to refixate. This indicates the recovery movement indicates the fusional ability. Now this is having a very poor fusion. The lady is not getting the eyes to realign easily. Now you can measure the squint by using the prism cover test. And we will just see how we can do it. <coughs> now the same child is having an isotropia. You put the prism bar in front of the eyes and this is a translucent occluder, the Spillman occluder. And you keep on moving the prism bar down to increase the deviation, to neutralize the deviation till the time we get no movement. Now here we get at about 25 prisms of ESO, we have a neutralization point. So we know it's a 25 prisms of base out or an esotropia. When we are covering the same eye and letting the eyes to see with both the eyes, this is known as a simultaneous prism cover test. Mind you, this may be in the exam. Sometimes 
uh, has asked you an alternate prism cover test or a prism alternate cover test PACT is little different. And in that we are covering one eye at any one time, not allowing the eyes to rejoin in between. So alternate PVCT is to measure a foria also, whereas a simultaneous PVCT is to measure the manifest squint or propia. Whenever you are using prisms, how to stack or should we stack prisms? No. Remember, 2 plus 2 is not 4, but it can become 5. As in Hindi, we say 2 or 2, 5. So that can be sometimes troublesome. So whenever you have to use prisms more than the required amount, you don't stack one over the other, but split the prism between the two eyes. Otherwise, you will have a faulty examination in your measurement. Also, when you are dealing with children who are having a high plus or high minus glasses in front of their eyes, remember a high plus lens also has a prismatic effect. Now, if you see these schematic diagrams, you will notice that there is a measured deviation is going to be different because of the prismatic induced prismatic effect. Uh, in an esotropia, a high plus lens will give rise to a base out prism effect. So it will underestimate the esotropia. And similarly, in exotropia, it will give a base in effect. So the measured deviation is going to be less than the true deviation if there is a high plus. So if a child is FAKIC and using FAKIC correction of plus 20 or 30, you will have a huge difference in your measurements. Similarly, a high myope, as you see in the lower pictures, it will be different. So you have these tables available in order to correct for the, uh, these induced prismatic effects which are going to be there. When we look into the fundus, we can look into the third dimension of another kind, that is the torsion. Now, what you see in this picture is a horizontal line which is there and another line joining the center of the disc and the fovea. Now, this is not uh, horizontal. It indicates there is an extortion and which may be because of an inferior oblique overaction. Whereas the other picture is showing you a correct positioning of the fovea, which should be between the two lines between the lower pole of the disc and the upper and lower third junction of the disc. You can also see on the indirect ophthalmoscopy the torsion effect or make a fundus photograph and measure the deviation of torsion which is there. And even a blind spot charting can tell you an extortion which if you are charting it properly. So the torsions can be measured by using the subjective method in the form of diplopia charting Lancaster red-green charts, double Maddox rod, which is the most um, uh, important test or most uh, used test for measuring the torsion. But you can use the Bogolny loose glasses also, and even the synoptophore can be used if you have for measuring the torsion. The most um, uh, useful test, of course, is the double Maddox rod test, and you can see the torsion, which can be measured by using uh, this and now, if you have a child who has a refractive error, which is uncorrected, it can give rise to two situations. Either the child is the kind who is a happy-go-lucky, he doesn't bother much, he doesn't accommodate, and he will have both the eyes leading to an ametropic amblyopia, or he may be the child who is very aggressive kind who will accommodate, and he will develop an accommodative esotropia. Now, if a child is seen to have an esotropia, the first thing that you need to do is do a proper cycloplegic refraction test, which means that we'll use atropine ointment for five year old, up to five year old child. And more than that, you can use homotropine eye drops to relax his cycloplegia and then assess the correct uh, refractive error and give him the full correction. And a fully accommodative isotropia can be easy corrected by this. Also use accommodative targets in order to induce the accommodative effort. Otherwise, you will miss an accommodative convergence excess like you see here. The moment I gave a pen which is having colored, the esotropia for near has become much more. When you have a convergence excess, we need to give bifocals which are executive type. That means they are bisecting the pupil uh, by the spectacle uh, upper and the lower uh, corrections. If you have a partially accommodative esotropia, what you need to do is give the full correction and then look for the esotropia for distance fixation. Any child having an ESO deviation for distance despite full correction means that there is a non-accommodative component and that is a partially accommodative isotropia. You can measure these AC by A ratio by either the heterophoria method or the gradient methods. These you can see in the books for more details. 
but remember you can have a variable measurement for both distance and near even in exotropia now this child is shown to have an exotropia distance fixation the deviations are much larger than for near fixation and it is not just breaking of the fusion as you can see for near fixation even with the occluder the deviation is less now this is known as a divergence excess exo and uh, you need to distinguish a true divergence excess from a simulated divergence excess and for that you will do a patch test for minimum 30 minutes and remeasure if you have a exotropia which is more for near fixation it may be a convergence insufficiency type of exotropia which needs to be tackled little differently so just measuring the deviations remember there are certain points we'll make one is difference between distance and near fixation that we just talked about we can classify the isotropia as basic a convergence excess or a divergence insufficiency type of isotropia similarly an exotropia may be a basic a convergence insufficiency or a divergence excess second thing that you can do the measurements is in the nine different gauges which will tell you if there is any incompetence which may be because of a paralytic or a restrictive squint the third inference that you have to make is look for the deviations in up gaze and down gaze and we will talk about this little more for looking for a and b patterns then the deviations in each eye fixing will let us know whether there is a primary or a secondary deviation and this will be the hallmark of a paralytic squint then the deviations with subjective method and the objective method like objective method is like doing a cover test and subjective method is like giving him prisms to neutralize the uh, diplopia which is there so this will also tell us if there is any correspondence difference a normal or a anomalous retinal correspondence and finally deviations with prolonged cover like in true divergence to separate from simulated divergence excess or a full exotropia and of course with them without glasses like we did for accommodative isotropias now coming to the a and b patterns what we need to do is look for the deviations in the primary position but then look for up and down gazes also up 25 degrees up and 30 uh, 35 degrees down gaze you have to see and if the deviations measured are more than 15 prism diopters we will call it as a significant b pattern now this as you can see here was a b pattern and this is an a pattern where the isotropia is becoming more in the up gaze compared to the down gaze and remember whenever you have a v pattern you will look for any overacting inferior oblique and any a pattern look for overacting superior oblique so you can also uh, remember if you are looking for underacting it will be just the opposite of these muscles now we coming back to these clinical pictures the exotropia in the primary position becomes much more on looking up and less in the down gaze as shown by the triangle inverted triangle this is a v pattern and when we look for in the side gazes you can see there is a hypertropia of the adducting eye as shown by the arrow now these are indicating both the sides there is an inferior oblique overaction so whenever you have a v pattern look for any presence of inferior oblique overaction remember it is not always that it will be an inferior oblique overaction in the presence of a significant v like this child has a significant v pattern but there is no inferior oblique overaction so you need to look for separately whenever there is a v exotropia look for an inferior oblique overaction 80% of the cases will have it but 15 20% may not have an inferior oblique overactions and they may have other reasons for causing the v pattern similarly when you have a a pattern look for superior oblique overaction as shown by the arrow showing downwards in adduction indicating the hypotropia so whenever we are looking for hyper or hypotropia don't go by how much cornea is covered but look for the limbus and compare the uh, superior limbus for superior oblique overaction and the inferior limbus for the inferior oblique overactions now here you have an asymmetric inferior oblique overaction as you can see in the left eye the deviation uh, of the of the inferior limbus is much more than the separation between the horizontal uh, the inferior limbus in the levo elevation whenever you have an a and b pattern we will have to manage them differently so just remember that if you have an oblique overaction you may weaken the obliques but otherwise you will have to shift these horizontal muscle so now this child has an ortho in the primary position but has a up gaze marked exo whereas in the down gaze there is an eso 
Now this is like a pure V pattern, ortho in primary, exo in up gaze, and eso in down gaze. And if you look for the inferior oblique overactions, they are there in either side. Now in such a situation, if you just operate on the inferior obliques on either side, it will solve the problem as it has been done here. You retain the ortho in primary position, you correct the exo in up gaze and the eso in down gaze as well as the inferior oblique overactions. Another thing that you need to look for is the dissociated vertical deviations or the DVD. Now, what do we mean by DVD? DVD is the uprolling of the eye, upward drift of the eye on covering. Now, as you see here, when we, so this is the sudden uh, uprolling of the eye behind a translucent occluder, and that comes back when we are removing the occluder. This is another picture showing you the DVD. Just look for it, the eye has drifted up and then it comes back on its own. So this is known as the dissociated vertical deviation. And for this, if you have to measure, you will use a prism undercover test. That means the prism bar would be behind the occluder in order to neutralize the hypertrophia. Now this is a DVD latent in the first picture. In the central picture, you can see the DVD which is manifest in the left eye. And then when you bring a graded density filter bar over the better eye, you will see that the light dependent phenomenon is getting self corrected so dvd in the left eye with an inferior oblique overactions can be seen here another test which will be done in cases of incompetent strabismus is the diplopia charting as shown in this case for a left inferior rectus palsy by using the red and green glasses you can do a least chart or a hest chart for documenting the uh, now we're going to talk and this because of shortage of time, I may not go, but there are these charts available in the books and you can be able to document and diagnose the type of ocular motility disturbance. And uh, we can discuss this if the time permits for the PGs that how we will use the HES charts and diagnose which type of problem is there. So this is the left Duane's retraction syndrome. This is a right Brown syndrome. There's a blowout fracture in the right eye. Another test which is done in cases of uh, the incompetent strabismus is the binocular fields of fixation. How much is the diplopia free area? And this will tell us about the prognosticating a uh, case of uh, uh, incompetent strabismus. Like in a blowout fracture, you can see how much improvement is happening. Finally, coming to the management, we will use non-surgical management techniques. First of all, glasses, even hyperopes gain by the correction of that. Amblyopia therapy, if required, you need to do that. Orthoptic exercises in the form of synoptophore anti-suppression or the uh, exercises, convergence exercises by using the uh, synoptophore or the prism bars. Over minus lenses is another therapy by which we can correct an exotropia. And then we use prisms for small angle deviations. Now here we show you an example of Fresnel prisms, of Fresnel prisms, having a child having an esotropia. And these striated marks, which are seen in the spectacle, you can see that there is a Fresnel prism correcting the uh, isotropia. The fusional convergence exercises can be given by using these uh, pencil push ups. But mind you, you need to first tell them about the physiological diplopia. Otherwise, the child may be using only one eye for uh, the pencil push ups and only improving the biceps and not the eyes. Over minus therapy is shown in these pictures. You can see here the eyes are deviating in the up gaze. In the Spillman occluder, you can see the right eye drifting out. But if she is given a minus two over minus correction, then the exo is getting corrected by using the accommodative convergence. The strabismus surgery, we'll just uh, talk about briefly. Just remember, SPG, that the weakening procedures can be in the form of recession. <coughs> which may be a conventional or a hangback recession. We may use retroequatorial or a Farden procedure. And in re-surgery, sometimes we may do a marginal myopathy. <coughs> and for strengthening, the resection of the muscle can be done or application or a double breasting of the muscle can be done to strengthen the muscles. Uh, the simple rule to remember is whenever you make the muscle lax, it becomes weak. And whenever you make the muscle taut, it becomes stronger. Just like a, t a student, if he is lax, he is going to be weak. And if he is taught T-A-U-G-H-T properly, he, the, like the muscle being taught, he becomes stronger. Uh, just showing you a brief uh, surgical procedure. 
here an LR recession by the Fornix incision approach. <coughs> a small nick has been made, and now we are using the Jensen's, Jameson's hook. The muscle has been hooked, and the conjunctiva is now gently lifted up with the help of the lens hook, and the muscle has been brought into the field of our surgery. Now you need to be careful and you incise the intramuscular septum on the opposite side, being careful that you are not splitting the muscle and you reaching the end of the full muscle. This is known as the pole test. Look for the end of the other insertion pole. The check ligaments are neatly dissected with the help of the scissors and you should keep the muscle sheath intact so that there is no bleeding. 60 vicral sutures are being passed, full uh, thickness in the muscle, and you take a central bite and then the interop locking bites at the two ends. And then you can disinsert the muscle, leaving a 0.5 millimeter stump. Uh, mild cautery is done at the bleeding points. Now, when you are holding the muscle insertion, be careful that whatever point you are holding is going to be dragged and you are going to displace it. So, never use the same point for marking. Use the pole for marking if you're holding the muscle at the center and mark it always perpendicularly. You can use GV paint or you can just depress the sclera and make it an impression on it. Passing the spatulated needles, you have to be careful that you do not cause any perforation and a good bite should be taken, but far enough between the two ends so that the muscle width is ensured after recession or rejection. So these two ends have been placed 8 to 10 millimeters away and then you can tie these sutures. You have your desired recession effect and the conjunctiva can then be closed with the A2 vital suture. <coughs> when should we operate? Now this is a very uh, in interesting and important topic to remember. A child may be born as a newborn with straight eyes, but he may start squinting around three months of age, like this case history and this is the famous case history of Dr. Kenneth Wright's son himself. And you see the eyes having an esotropia. Glasses are given at six months of age and still the Bruckner's reflex in the uh, lower picture you can see indicates there is a residual esotropia in spite of full correction. So the surgery is done by the dynamic pediatric ophthalmic surgeon Dr. Kenneth Wright at the age of six months to ensure that the eyes are early aligned. And this child has been gifted with stereopsis. This could be the story of each and every child of our country, which comes to you. And so you need to do what is known as early alignment, not just early surgery, but early alignment. So the timing of surgery for esotropia could be as early as the first year of life. Similarly for exotropia, if it's an intermittent, you can wait and watch. But remember that you have to be acting whenever the uh, manifestation becomes more than 50% of the times. Observe for the distance and near stereopsis, which will give you an indication of the binocular vision getting lost. So this child having uh, at one year of age, having a manifest exotropia would have to be operated just like an infantile esotropia early. And then we can have a restoring the binocular vision to the, uh, these children. So remember the critic, cricket's rule of fours and sixes, four to six weeks for congenital cataract as Dr. Ramesh would be talking about. Four to six months, you start looking for infantile esotropia and correct it by first year of life. Four to six years, correct the intermittent exotropias or nystagmus, which are manifest. And then only we can ensure that the binocular vision can be restored. Thank you very much for this talk. I would be now uh, open to any questions. Awesome, sir. Awesome, sir. We, we... We are we are like uh, collecting the questions which are being typed into us. One question which has come down is like, uh, is it always atropine and homotropine? And uh, how many which visit you will do that, sir? The first visit of the child, or will the child come for subsequent visits and get this done? Okay. This is a question probably from an young ophthalmologist. Sir. Correct. So I think it's a very important question that which cycloplegia should be used. So as I said, it will be age dependent. Less than five years, we usually use atropine ointment. Mind you, not drops, but atropine ointment. 
because drops can be systemically absorbed and it can be uh, causing the toxicity of the atropine. So you should prefer to use atropine ointment, a rice grain size, used, uh, we usually use twice a day for three days to have the effect. Older children, six years and above, we can use home atropine, uh, which is 2% eye drops. And we are using it on the first day, I mean, whenever the first visit itself to save time. Once you have made your uh, assessment that the child is having uh, an eusotropia and you would like to correct the glasses, then you, you should do a home atropine examination if the child is older than six years. And I usually, even in the young adults, I would prefer to do a proper cycloplegic uh, assessment. That means home atropine 2%. Even in the younger adults, because sometimes they may be having an accommodative effort. And recently, we have found because of the lockdown effect and a lock, lot of near work, uh, there has been a lot of accommodative convergence spasms. So, we sometimes even have to use atropine in little older children also to relax their accommodation fully. So, we should use 2% homotropine. People do use 1% cyclopentulate also. Uh, I have come across some children having. Uh, some uh, cranial, uh, I mean, some disturbance of the CNS. So I usually avoid uh, cyclopentulate, which I see in Indian children, it's more possible that there can be there. Homotropine, I have found to be very, very safe. So my preference is always to 2% homotropine. Uh, tropicamide should not be used as a cycloplegic agent. It is a good agent for retina people for dilating uh, yeah. for a cyclopegia. And homotropine, how will you dose it, sir? Okay, so homotropine when we are using in the, uh, uh, in the clinic itself, I usually use one drop at 10 minutes interval for three drops. And at, after 30 minutes, usually the effect has come. You can just check it that he is not able to read the near chart and then you can uh, go ahead with your refraction. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Another question has come in and that question is like, uh, it is saying like, if we have to divide the prisms and the muscle correction between both the eyes for a given deviation, how do you divide it between the eyes? Even if the deviation is from one eye, will the prisms be for both eyes? Right. So what probably is asking is uh, maybe in a situation of an incompetent strabismus, in yes. concomitant or alternating iso or exotropias, of course, it doesn't make much of a difference. You can easily divide the prism between the two eyes and it will not change. But if there is an incompetent strabismus, I think the questioner has in mind there will be a difference of primary versus secondary deviation measurement. right? So what you need to do is each time you are covering and making the eye fixate, so you can then decide which you are measuring. Even though you are dividing the prism between the two eyes, you can ensure by a cover test that which is the fixing eye. So you will know whether it is the primary or a secondary deviation and you can still use between the two prisms, between the two eyes, the prisms uh, over each eye. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this another question, sir, I think from a young student, he is asking that pole test which you described pole test. when you are checking the muscle uh, insertion. Can Correct. you explain it again? Yes, sir. So should I show the video again if possible? I mean, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And there is a request for the HES chart also, sir. Okay. <laughs> they, they want the HES chart in detail. Yeah. Sure, sir. Uh, uh, if the time permits, yes, we can definitely. Yes, sir. We have time, sir. We have time. So we'll go ahead with the surgery. I mean, uh, just. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, sir. What you see here is first of all, remember that we are sitting on the side of the patient, and uh, yeah. you can use either a suture or you can use just a forceps to uh, retract the globe. And now, after a small nick in the conjunctiva, a Jemison's hook has been introduced. First, it was, if you notice, it was in the opposite direction, and then we. Uh, hug against the sclera. Now, the other hook has been passed and now the, with the lens hook, we are separating uh, and making the muscle come in the exposed area. Now, this is the point which the questionnaire had asked, looking for the intramuscular septum dissection here. This is the pole because this is very important. Suppose you have split the muscle, then you would have left some of the muscle fibers and it will cause also. So don't do an incision until you have seen that the other pole is visible. Has it been yeah. seen? Yes. yes, yes, sir. It's clearly seen. Yeah. So that was the important thing that we need to see. And of course, when we are using the 6-0 vitreal sutures, I usually use three bites, one in the center and two interlocking bites at the two ends so that we have a good grip. And it will be all full thickness bites in the muscle. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. 
partial thickness bites in the sclera that's simple to remember yeah yeah now coming to the uh, back to the hess chart yes okay i'll show you a video also which we have made of hess charting yeah. or least charting some of you may have seen the least chart now we are going to talk about hess screen on least screen it is based on the principle where a mirror system is used to dissociate the two eyes and document the relative incompetence under actions and over actions of the yoke muscles by fixing one eye in different gaze positions and noting the excursion of the fellow eye about the design and parts is made up of two square translucent screens with each measuring 3 feet wide and 3 and a half feet long and are set at 90 degrees to each other a mirror septum is located in between the two the screens are marked with a series of lines forming squares of 5 degrees each from the central zero point three squares in each direction marks the inner square formed by additional eight points an outer square of 16 dots as excursion of 30 degrees in each direction a chin rest is positioned in such a way that the patient lies at 50 cm from either screen now we are going to demonstrate the use in a normal individual one screen is viewed straight and other through the mirror the fixating screen is illuminated and the examiner points at the eight points of the inner square one by one with a metal wand the subject superimposes these points with another wand the other screen is illuminated to reveal the hess screen and the notation is made on the chart first the left eye is charted with the right eye fixating and then the right eye is charted with the left eye fixating okay so you saw that these are in a yes, what you would see was was that and if you have a problem now we are going to talk uh, this was the voice of dr deep shekhar das one of my senior resident at the center and yeah uh, we should remember him and these are the pictures now where when you have a problem like right eye fourth nerve palsy what you see here in these pictures is there is the uh, tilt of the squares at the outset it tells you that there is a torsion which is there there is a recent onset superior oblique under action you will see this whole square being tilted in addition to the under action which is seen on the uh, the red lines uh, mi missing away in the uh, right eye so the right eye is a little higher than the other and in the outer squares you can see that the uh, there is a magnification effect of the problem so even for smaller perisys the importance of charting the outer square is much more and you can pick up these uh, smaller uh, devi deviations or paralysis also if yeah. there is longer yeah. at putner palsy here then you'll see that the torsion effect has gone yeah this is an asymmetric putner palsy but bilateral you can see that there is an under action of the superior oblique on both the sides yeah so there is a little lectus under action on the right eye now you see the squares you will see that there is an under action of the right eye abduction on the temporal side it is not going the same excursion and yeah. on uh, the left eye you can see an overacting medial rectus which is causing much more excursion than the uh, right eye so uh, the yeah. narrowing of the uh, squares and becoming more cylindrical indicates there is a paralysis of the lateral rectus yeah a six nerve yeah. palsy which is little older indicating a spread of comitance happening and a bilateral asymmetric six nerve palsy is shown here in both the sides of the under action of the abduction of the lateral rectus this is a duet retraction syndrome now sometimes this can be a little confusing to see because you have to look carefully here what you see is that both the abduction and adduction are limited in the left eye in the left eye which is on the left hand side os you will see that the abduction as well as adduction excursions are both limited in the other muscle both are overacting medial and the lateral leg here this is leading to not just simple six nerve palsy but it is a duane's retraction syndrome because even adduction is affected 
brown syndrome you will pick up if you see the underaction of the inferior and uh, and there is a, a overaction in the opposite muscle of the synergous muscle and a blowout fracture you will see that both elevation depression are affected in the same eye now this is indicating that this is a blow out fracture in which both the elevators and depressors have been affected because of the uh, entrapment of the inferior vessels that about the uh, hessen issues yeah yes sir beautiful sir one more question has been typed in sir and it's asking when we are assessing av gaze that 25 degree up and 35 degree down why that 25 and 35 sir is it arbitrary or no no it's not arbitrary there is a reason for uh, that so it's a very good question i think it's an intelligent question i would say we make 25 degrees up and 35 degrees down and not 25 degrees down why because yeah. down gazes are more important when we are uh, at the height of let's say 5 or 6 feet Uh, when we look at the floor it will be about 35 degrees or more so we will uh, have difficulty in the down gaze much more uh, troubling us if there is a superior oblique palsy then more of a problem whereas if you have a brown syndrome the uh, only a mild one the, the elevation may not have much of problem so that's why we have a larger um, uh, 35 degrees compared to the up gaze we make only 25 degrees yes sir yes sir yes sir i think with that the questions uh, we have covered all the questions sir uh, 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 big yeah. thanks for yeah. ramesh sir time is up for ramesh yeah your dr jayanthan any more questions you have on the screen no oh, sir it's all done sir ah uh, we have covered ramesh sir would you have feedback no no, no. <laughs> We are talking. <laughs> maybe I, I was just telling, sir. Like he demonstrated one A pattern PTS for surgery. Uh, I never seen a superior oblique till then, 20 years back. It was in a, in a CME, a surgical CME. And I came back. I had an A pattern, and I had the guts to open up the, the uh, muscles and do a surgery. That's a sort of uh, uh, teaching uh, impact he has on the PTS. So I yes. think whoever is uh, interested in subspecialty. I think if you just uh, be part of him, you'll learn. <laughs> yeah, sir. Yes, sir. True, sir. Really, really. Fine words. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you all. Yeah, I think sir. Thank you for listening, uh, Dr. Raj Shekhar for nicely conducting, Dr. Jayanthan, Dr. Lognathan, Ramakrishnan. Thank you all for giving me this invitation and giving me this opportunity. Yes, yeah, sir. We are really very thankful, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's a blessing. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. so dear friends now we come to the second part uh, with the second master trainer dr ramesh from mahatme ai hospital sir has a excellent repertoire of surgical experience behind him and uh, he is talking to us on pediatric ophthalmology pediatric cataract surgery and we all understand that pediatric cataract is then more upfront in assessment of the child selecting the ivls than exactly in the operating table most of the surgery happens in the pre op and post op than in the actual surgery so most of the surgeon skills are expected in these areas also so we'll go to ramesh sir for enlightening us on pediatric cataract tips tricks and nuances sir over to you sir Uh, just a minute i am sharing my screen yeah yeah please thank, thank you tnoa thank you more rajan sir thank you uh, rashir sir jayendran madhavan sir and i uh, really we, we, i think we should all thank uh, avadesh sharma sir to be part of us and made this program a really a very beautiful uh, teaching part of the curriculum and uh, when when it comes to rashir sir says that uh, uh, about the canal cataract see this is a i always say this is a uh, the, this patients we need to care lifelong who's yeah. lifelong is i have the question because <laughs> <laughs> as a 57 year old practicing pediatric ophthalmologist i i frankly tell the patient maybe 20 years time even if i vanish someone is going to take responsibility of this children because they need to be followed up lifelong so let us go into the uh, topic proper 
and uh, we all know what is congenital cataract so i am not going to talk anything very much great but certain basic points i really want to touch upon so even though the incidence of congenital cataract is pretty much uh, low but the management skill diagnostic skill and post surgical management the complication it all makes it a real uh, challenging uh, situation and many times they come to us as a simple ligocoria or sometimes even in a lamellar or a zonular cataract we do pick them up at the age of 5 or 6 in a school screening program so we need to know the differential diagnosis of ligocoria the commonest always talked about is retinoblastoma rop phpv so we need to you know you know it's not o diagnose or bis diagnose certain other uh, vital diseases and it it goes back to the embryology of the lens and uh, i i still remember videsh master's book like uh, six cranial nerves have something in association with the vision component like that developmentally brain and uh, optic uh, vesicles happen as early as six weeks of uh, post gestation so beyond which there is a, a limit to the viral access in case of a rubella infection so these are all the certain uh, gestational days which we should remember to come out across against the diagnosis of what type of morphological cataract we are handling type of intensity of amblyopia it can present and there are other comorbid uh, diseases uh, conditions in the body which we need to address and etiology many times we see them as idiopathic if it's hereditary mostly it's autosomal dominant but it can be otherwise also there has been something like 40 genes and lose has been isolated that's not beyond the scope of this discussion but what are the co ocular anomalies you can always face many times it could be microphthalmia aniridia very rarely in rop phvv and they can be associated with anti segment degeneration syndrome in that case we may be handling a glaucoma as well and commonest we always encounter it is getting lesser by the better immunization of rubella is infectious as you all know the basic common test we always have to do before evaluating taking the first surgery is a touch titer so rubella infection and that has to be the history has to be properly elicited at what uh, gestational period they contacted the infection and other systemic syndromes very much rare the others could be something like a trauma radiation due which they myself not be aware of and new age is in certain complicated cataract situation and diabetic arthritis Uh, yes, no, yes, sir. Now you are visible. You can continue. One second. Suddenly, it went back to the first screen. Uh, yes, sir. Now you can do slide show mode, and you are perfectly visible and audible now. Yeah. And. Uh, there will be some hidden metabolic disorders causing anal cataract also not that so that's so common but we need to have them in mind so when we evaluate them uh, on a pre operative evaluation sheet we should look for these conditions when we see an oil droplet like cataract it could be an increase increased sorbitol accumulation as in case of a galactosemia or we may be handling a case of a hypocalcemia sometimes uh, vitamin d deficiency could be a cause for a uh, uh, zonular cataract also so the membrane damage resulting in low calcium levels in aqueous humor and the sodium content increase in the lens causes a cataract so hypoglycemia sorbitol dehydrogenase deficiency with accumulation of sorbitol resulting in cataract so all these things has to be kept in mind because they may have co coexisting uh, systemic anomalies which has to be handled accordingly and this is a very beautiful flow chart so first thing you ask for the family history or affected member of the family then you need they need to go for a genetic reference if that's not the case there's no no is the answer then look for any facial or ocular dysmorphism then again a chromosomal analysis and genetic reference has to be done if it is still there is a no is an answer then we go to the history of pregnancy resulting in any rashes during the first trimester illnesses positive tests like that any other intrauterine infections resulting in other cardiac or any other structure another hormonal anomaly a pediatric referral is always very much essential even as a part of treatment and as a part of pre operative work up also then if that still there's a no the answer then pay late to thrive systemic problems rule out all metabolic disorders and finally if everything is ruled out then we'll end up with a sporadic developmental cataract 
and uh, that's this is what mostly we see now, now. and anatomically you all know uh, blue dot cataract it is a uh, very uh, insignificant one not, not much of visual uh, loss we just ignore them zonular cataract quite commonly seen as you see in this picture this is due to a transient toxic influence during the embryogenesis uh, situation calcium and vitamin d deficiency during pregnancy can also cause it coronary cataract the nuclear cataract basically we have this embryonic nuclei infantile nuclei then the layers of nucleus in most of the nucleus cat nuclear cataract we see and it could be a total congenital cataract also as we see in like a rubellar cataract polar cataract usually unilateral they are associated with remnants of cuticular ascular lentis and usually they have dense amblyopia most unilateral cataracts have dense amblyopia orally formed cataract this is one of our patient we had a surgery anterior polar cataract usually on routine evaluation we detect them then they can cause some refractory error so treat them accordingly many times they don't require a surgery sutural cataract of course we see incidentally in a sit lamp never never cause any visual uh, anomaly and history taking we need to ask about history of consanguineous marriage because i have experience of mother getting my mother operated in uh, school days she came back getting uh, married to her own maternal uncle uh, her uh, son had a very total dense cataract bilateral with nystagmus so all these things are essential and fever with rash we were discussing about this uh, rubella infection uh, nutritional deficiency and medication and radiation which many times they may not be aware of because they don't know the sensational rage properly so they may have got accidentally exposed to radiation and all other uh, post natal history regarding the child's uh, general body status uh, the child cry immediately after birth was there any birth asphyxia birth trauma was the child in oxygen therapy intubator care uh, other systemic anomalies so that before you plan for a surgery all these things are very very important when we are handling an mr child it makes it even more challenging and basic investigations to rule out infections and anemia and uh the common things uh, the basic precautions we take is for us as as also hiv and hepatitis a base antigen test but the most important things will be the uh, urine for reducing substances to detect the inborn errors of metabolism and as a repetition again torch titer toxoplasma infections rubella cmv and herpes simplex so all these things evaluations even in medical legal point of view is essential because unless we have a negative reply we cannot take them up for surgery and not to undermine the uh, pediatrician's role because before jumping them to take them as sporadic and developmental cataract we need to get a clean sheet from a pediatrician to rule out all other systemic anomalies and any anesthetic risk involved and a fitness for a anesthetic uh, procedure and as the rajesh sir rightly mentioned the pre operative assessment and the post operative period daily is a very very important thing because unlike in adult adult cataract wherein we have the patient's cooperation here we don't we don't have uh, any such uh, uh, it's not, it's not that that simple so evaluation under microscope under anesthesia preferably intubated not under iv sedation because the anesthetists don't have a control of the child's respiratory status when they are under iv sedation it's a very simple procedure nowadays anesthetic procedures type of lenticular opacity as we are assessed to decide about the surgical indication corneal clarity in, is there any other comorbid corneal uh, pathology like uh, any other syndromes pupillary dilatation pupillary status irregularity irregularity colobomas and dilatation it is to plan for the surgical procedure and biometry we all know like biometry it's a child's play it's just the other way in a, in a, in a child biometry in a in a intubated child it's not that simple it's a bit difficult we have the luxury of having a handheld carotometer it makes the life easy but that's not the case in most of the cases so we can use the standard uh, carotometer and biometer only thing is we need to have a support of a paramedical staff to measure the all the uh, axial length inter chamber depth and lens thickness immersion scan is always preferable if we have one the margin of error is very minimal but even otherwise don't worry about it A scan reading with maximum anterior depth should be taken. The, the value is done through this thing. This is just to show the setup what we really do in our own uh, uh, setup. One thing is we should not put any speculum on the child when you do a carotometer or an axillary measurement because that can compress the globe. And no, value of a B scan, yes, because when we have a total dense cataract, don't get misled by just the cataract and go ahead and start a surgery. Always assess the 
the vitreous and retinochoroidal cells are complex for any uh, persistent uh, primary hyaluronic vessels there could be some subluxed subluxed cataract changes cataract which can be uh, noted down which mean we have to plan accordingly and presently ubm which was very widely used in glaucoma management nowadays they are giving beautiful analysis of the corneal thickness ac depth sulcus analysis which is the most important key for implanting an intraocular lens in a child sulcus to sulcus measurement integrated of capsule the picture one down here is one of our cases which is a polar cataract we can obviously observe it but still and ubm gives us the amount of pc degesens you can plan your surgery so that you don't have any drop nucleus material you cannot you, there is not hardly any uh, nu uh, hard nucleus here but at least even a drops nucleus drop lens material can produce severe inflammation in this cases and a baby with a degesen posterior capsule a phpv these all can be pre operatively be very much picked up and to value the value the uh role of role of role of uh, ocular atnexa evaluation many times as our mind starts focusing on the cataract we lose our uh, field of vision we just focus only on cataract sac obstruction as you can see on the video uh played there you just see how much of pus is pouring out of the sac it's a case of a canal cataract evaluation done under anesthesia so this will land up with a dramatic complication of endophthalmitis had you not assessed this condition treat the sac condition treat the adnexal infections then plan for a surgery very very important assess the lid margins treat all the any ocular anterior segment infective situations perkins we have one yes we have we do in our institution but if not doesn't matter a shots will be sufficient corneal diameter to be measured with caliper because as you all know any any corneal diameter less than 10 mm is a contraindication for a eye wall implantation corneal wetting in between procedures keep your assistants to keep the cornea moist is very very important because as the cornea gets dry your valleys go heavy and we cannot visualize structures that very clearly a retinoscopy to be performed when when we when we do a, a pre and even in a post surgical situation also to assess the refractory status and the pre operative factors playing a major role in post operative visual outcome when you, whenever you see a child with a nystagmus strabismus you know you are in for a bad prognosis they have six times less chance of retaining 20 40 visual acuity compared to a normal child type of cataract morphology really plays a lot of role the intensity of amblyopia can be diagnosed laterality is it bilateral or unilateral unilateral always have a poor prognosis age of onset decides whether it is congenital or developmental so all these things has to be have in mind i will power calculation is a big debate big debate but then don't worry about it because invariably we are going to have a myopic shift in these children because the anterior segment growth becomes almost close to an adult size by the age of 3 years but your posterior segment keeps growing so how much ever you under correct you are going to have a myopic shift so with experience and institutions have their own formulas and most of the instruments are designed for adult eyes so we may have some inaccuracies and most of the adult formulas are excellently good now but then they don't really work for a children size so the basic formulas still work for us keratin extraction with the posterior excess and anterior vitrectomy makes the effective lens position a bit go heavy but there have been lot of studies on this and one of the uh, pioneers in uh, pediatric keratin management in the country and maybe internationally also his interest goes in american meats are very much wanted he he uses srkt and holidayty and rp center aims the use an srk2 formula in our center we use an srkt formula and extremely short eyes any eye less than 17 mm of millimeter mercury never place an intraocular lens so anything less than 20 srkt and holiday to the formula really works very well and talking to the parents regarding what you are really going to do it's not an adult cat try where you going to operate and give the patient 66 if the if at all maximum something like a pco happens to him we may do a yeah the same happens to him we treat him with steroids they become all right but here we have a lifelong uh, uh, management in the form of probable glaucoma retinal detachment possibilities even though very minimal keep updating the basic refractory error that's the most important thing even if you undercorrect this children with and leave them hypermetro as they grow towards hematopia and shift towards myopia keep updating refraction change the glass appropriately proper glasses and giving them a bifocal lenses as they start into the school so all the six and surgery should be performed if the issue is less than 
probably guys know the answer anything less than 618 but it's a zonal or cataract and any central opacity beyond 3 mm needs a surgery and when it comes to surgery i'll say it's always a general anesthesia is preferred maybe there can be a few difference of opinion in this but this is a comfort zone for the for the surgeon especially and then the anesthetist to handle the kit comfortably and instrumentation nothing very much great but still right size speculums and the most most important things is have the right set right set of instruments first 23.5 gauge instruments the form of micro scissors and micro scissors forceps because they go a long way in your uh, this this these are very tiny instruments and i'll show you a video of how i do the rexus it it goes through a small side port of 1 mm and these are the only ones that can handle the uh, elastic capsule you uh, properly and uh, sometimes in a case with a less than 6 months baby infant we can finish the surgery with the two small side port incision or itself it's that that simple so and not under underestimating that we should have a good vitectomy cutter preferably a new one and uh, uh, visco adaptive uh, and visco adaptive uh, visco co cohesive visco adaptive like helon wherein you have to load the back to prop properly implant the eye wall in the back and certain smaller things like positioning the head because as a adult cataract we don't give much of a thoughts to that you can easily rotate the patient's head is a is alert but child once under anesthesia is under anesthesia it's not the case due to parallax error the surgeon can have immense uh, difficulty in focusing the eye it may focus on one side the other side goes out of focus so head positioning with the help of and uh, before the before we drape the child should be properly placed with the proper ring size proper speculums and never uh, ever uh, uh, leave the other eye to be patched before it drape because for the risk of dryness of cornea and exposure keratitis that's a very 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 important thing i sometimes even patch they put a tape on both eyes if the, 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 there is some time delay in getting the child ready because the corneal dryness as you are all we have undergone we have had a surgery done for the expert surgeons the lower uh, or one third gets exposed it becomes dry it, it's a, it's a surgical nightmare and it's a management nightmare if they become exposure keratitis and this is a photograph to show how properly the neck is extended so that uh, my answer is i asked him to give him some sort of a small pillow or a rolled uh, towel sheet or even an iv bottle and so that it gives a, a surgeon a good comfort and we have the chest rod beyond which is the uh, beneath is the uh, beneath beneath that is the uns, uh, unsterile zone where the anesthetist can handle the upper back comfortably and the surgeon sits on the head and side and my preferred technique is i have i do a two side ports nasal and temporal one arm incision and main port in case of eye wall insertion 2.2 i make and then i convert it to 2.8 and then uh, i i info insert a foldable lens the incision should be limbal or slightly sclerer not not like in an uh, adult it should be purely corneal because for the reason that we don't want the wound to uh, gape and anterior rexus unlike in uh, adult cases we can never perform it this with a uh, cystito because it's so elastic so runaway rexus and larger rexus is not the right uh, thing we should happen we should have a beautiful overlap of the intraocular lens so the thickness of the lens is uh, anterior capsule is 11 to 10 15 micrometers i'm just showing a video of how i perform my anterior rexus tightly uh, pack the cham chamber with the uh, cohesive visco to initiate here just to initiate i'm using a for the puncture as a cito and that's it now preferably the surgeon if he is ambidextric is easy because now i am using the surgeon is using his left hand to this is the right eye the temporal 6 clock hours he is using the left hand and uh, the surgeon is using the zonlar rim as a marker just keeping the rexus 0.5 mm less than the zonlar rim so that you 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 will see that it at the end of surgery it, it becomes like a ideal 5 mm rexus and when it comes to the nasal half of the right eye the surgeon uses the right hand six clock hours is covered so after dextric practice of the younger ophthalmologist when you do a keratic surgery i strongly recommend it because you will become an excellent keratic surgeon 
pico surgeon and you can handle pediatric cataract also beautifully because pediatric cataract surgery is all about performing the perfect perfect nobody uh, performing the perfect anterexus and posterexus it's all about a skill just focusing on your rexus so start i'll i'll recommend all the younger ophthalmologists to start practice rexus in all your cases attempt rexus in all your cases and if you have the possibility of using this uh, micro instruments use them in certain mature cataracts adult cataracts so that you get a feel of how to hold them and if you see it is more of a centripetal force i keep pulling the capsule to the center of the nucleus just to the center not just a circumferential movement because otherwise you land up with a very large rexus so that's the anterior rexus and lens aspiration is literally a child's play because i am i am always a uh, 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 favoring uh, i always do a bimodal aspiration technique in my adult cataract that's why i got used to it i think i think that you should you should do coaxial hydro dissection uh, is it's can be done not a must because it's a very soft cataract and in this video i have not done any hydro here we have a uh, zonlar uh, central uh, cataract where in the as you all know the zonlar cataract is that uh, an infantile nucleus that is cataractous and surrounded by a clear zone so it's it it, it is uh, but these are the ones which have very beautiful visual outcome that's a best of the cataracts to manage so in this case i am just loosening up out all the peripheral cortex from the equator seeing to that that i do a thorough uh, stripping not leaving behind any uh, lens fibers but then equator is going to generate lens fibers mind you so it's not we are not going to stop it but then at least in surgery wise maximum do as far as possible a thorough uh, this mechanized uh, ia system nowadays is really beautiful it helps us do a very beautiful wash in spite if we don't use a proper lens design like a uh, square designs still there is a chance of a visual axis opacification that will come to a bit later so i am almost finishing on my uh, clear uh, uh, zone aspiration uh, just for a demo it just happened in this case it happened this is a, this is a zonlar uh, carrot uh, that bit of it and it, it again gets easily aspirated it's just uh, uh, lens aspiration as as such takes very minimal time the whole surgery the whole lot of time is spent on your uh, anti rexus and then comes a even more a challenge so and uh, in some cases if the nucleus is slightly calcified as it happens in a fibrous cataract long standing cataract coming to us with a late presentation you may have to use your phaco probe do a phaco phaco aspiration no no energy involved just purely vacuum it just uh, through a through a 2.2 uh, mycs uh, opening can do it or be accordingly 2.8 also it's okay postic capsule all know is a thickest basement membrane in our body but uh, sometimes i always feel how is it visible capsule consists mainly of collagen highly elastic due to the lamellar arrangement that you can see as you witness in the procedure the lens capsule is composed of trypho collagen it's very thin so you can imagine how thin a tissue we are handling and we get scared in an adult when we get a pcr but the only advantage here is it's so elastic it doesn't run away to the periphery and uh, you know visual axis opacification is almost close to 100% in a young children so how best you manage this post op capsule makes the success of the surgery and as i was telling you before the centripetal pull grabbing and regrasping every clock hour and allow the capsule to retreat back to see how much the capsule has this is has happened very important keep them at least 1 mm smaller than the anterior rexus and it's a must in patients at least less than 6 or 5 years of age older age group if they are have an mr we are handling an retarded child with an nystagmus where you cannot do a laser always perform a rexus in that age group also just a, a video of uh, how a post rexus perform uh, on high zoom initially you have to make a nick with the cystitome and it is uh, sometimes I always feel like as if we are uh, floating on a free space i always compare with people have seen the movie called gravity i don't know how someone feels when they are floating in a free space so that sort of feel happens for the surgeon because you you don't have the tactile feel of the capsule in your hand at all it's more by your intuition and your visibility that you are holding something very slim and you have to do whatever uh, technique uh, pull push grab grasp 
and ultimately you have to make it like uh, but it is possible it is possible i have done some sort of spiraling in cases of uh, posterior excess converted this gave, gave me a courage to convert adult pcr into pcr excess because it, uh, it, it, it gives a very uh, solid uh, edge than doing a posterior capsulotomy by a vitrectomy cutter or any other procedure so once you see the posterior excess is complete now we can see that it is almost complete and a very flimsy posterior capsule is being removed out of the eye. That is the second most uh, challenging after anterior excess, then this step, then comes the next step. But uh, I read an article about staining the posterior capsule. We tried it in a case, but then it didn't give much of a, a change for me. Something is very difficult to grab. It's almost the excess is complete, but it's bit. I can see that it's it's like a very thin tissue, and you can beautifully see the uh, posterior excess, anterior excess, IOL very well centered in the back, the post op you know, and anterior vitrectomy. As uh, cataract surgeons, we are all familiar with this, but only certain vital points I suggest, suggest is uh, why anterior vitrectomy because. Just doing a rexus alone is not sufficient because the anterior hyaloid phase can act as a scaffold for the proliferation of epithelial cells from the equator. That's the reason why you have to create an optically empty uh, space in the anterior vitreous. And present um, technology of echo machines with the active fluidics, closed chamber technique, high cut rates, they have very minimal vitreous traction and very minimal stress on the peripheral retina. So this, this can be done uh, very beautifully. And to be performed before the lens insertion because once you put the lens it's very difficult to lift the lens and take your probe underneath can be done and a uh, little bit under the posterior excess margin also so at the end of the uh, vitrectomy your posterior cap should be free and the opening should be circular and there should not be any tenting or peaking that could be a strand there in that case have a diluted triumphstone stain the if there's any anterior vitreous strand and do a proper vitrectomy and below five to six years vitrectomy is always the best And since our uh, we can we can uh, as a bimanual technique irrigation in one hand and cutter and aspirate in the other hand, it becomes a very nice closed chamber technique. But in spite children having a low skeletal rigidity, we do see a minimal of a globe collapse uh, under cornea collapsing. But it, it reforms with the irrigation on. You don't have to panic. And uh, here the slide here is uh, I'm showing a, a triumphal staining. And it is mandatory because if we have a vitreous strand in the side port or the main wound, it's going to cause uh, really a lot of complications in the form of uh, maybe late infection and even uh, arterial detachment. Vitrorexis is also being mentioned through pars plicata, a sutureless 24 guide vitrectomy. After placing the eye oil, we can, use, we can cut, but then uh, the advantage is it's got a better anti semi stability, but less post op and less post op experience. The only thing is, are we comfortable in doing a pass back at a procedure, unlike our VR colleagues? And the tensile strength is usually lower than the curvilinear capsular excess. It has been, there has been electro microscopy study also. I will insertion, even though it may sound as simple, it's not like an adult case wherein uh, inserting it properly into the back. Bloating the bag with the uh, visco adaptives is really a, 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 a tricky thing. So we need to be really be very careful on this. Uh, any children less than seven months, we don't put an IOL. Uh, beyond two years, certainly yes. Seven to twenty-two years of twenty-two months of uh, infantile cataracts, uh, depending upon the corneal diameter, there's not a microphthalmus, still you can go ahead. And always uh, a single piece hydrophobic acrylic IOL, we are going to use a foldable lens. But if you are using a scleral incision, maybe in the bag insertion, uh, a three piece lens also can be suggested, but not that easy to insert compared to a single piece hydrophobic foldable lens. A square edge designs uh, reduce the uh, inhibits the lens epithelial migrations. And it's a technique because uh, I go with a cartridge right into the eye because I don't want the lens to release. Impro in an improper manner. So it has to release the, the, the initial haptic has to just go right under the anterior capsular rim. So it should not, it should not go into the posterior opening. That's the most important key. Some, some surgeons can, will keep the left hand and uh, any, any uh, a blunt instrument to 
guide the lens into the back once into the back then we can always position it it's not a problem at all and these lenses are very gently unfolding uh, my my favorable lens is an acrosoft lens it's been time tested uh, clear white lens and uh, the the haptics are so it really anchors the lens very much in the in the back some fine adjustments can be made sometimes it can the haptics can get bit stuck on the on the equators on the equators we can reposition it and you can enter the procedure you can see that the central axis is nicely placed and the anterior axis the, the good overlap of anterior axis also that's more important and then just positioning the lens properly so that there is no drag on the posterior capsule suturing these cases however miniature opening you are making since the eye is already low scale rigidity and it becomes soft with vitreous uh, vitrectomy uh, always suture the main wound and the side ports and to prevent post operative wound leak and chance of infection and children they can rub the eyes we cannot afford to take them again into uh, or anesthesia and resuturing teno nylon non absorbable is always safer i never tried any teno vicryl uh and it need need suture more later on but that is a simple affair uh basic complications we may land up with runaway excess in that case we may have to abandon iol uh post uh, exam capsular tear can happen in a case of a grown up children uh, degesens or a traumatic cataract very rarely intraoperative hyphema when you are going to badly handle the iris uh, standard post operative uh, procedures will be steroids uh diflupredinate will be sufficient but if, if you need a intense steroids go for a prednisolone antibiotic in the form of topramycin and uh, keep the people dilated post operative complications if you don't do a proper wound suturing can have wound leak corneal edema there is a, a, a transient iop spike following uh, retained ovds and fibrin membrane can be quite common so there has been a lot of talks about heparin portal lens and all those things but then nowadays with very minimal intervention we hardly see much of this inflammation pupillary capture yes like uh, if we, we are using a three piece lens rolling haptics then there is a uh, the lens in the sulcus then there that can be a chance of a capture the intraocular reaction it's what the common as we think we should be knowing about is mainly due to the immaturity of blood aqueous barrier there is insufficient fibrinolytic activity by trabecular mushroom and the foreign body reaction to iol but now it is very minimized but still you anticipate that and i'll recommend you to see the child under a microscope not under a slit lamp it's again not possible you don't need to sedate them just take this infant wrap them up and just hold tightly and look into the microscope day 1 day 5 and week 2 3 weeks depending upon the the need for it late post operative we all know which is axoplasmation is close to 100 percent so peak following up regularly glaucoma later on in the age group more common in aphicias than in pseudo aphicias blood attachment yes even the complication rate is very minimal do anticipate that uh, this is something about the younger the age in surgery that's a increased risk of glaucoma because they may have associated angle dysgenesis also uh, optic disc cupping has been a certain article says it can be reversible in primary congenital glaucoma but not so in a glaucoma in aphicia and uh, Visual axial pacification. UBM is giving us a lot of uh, insight into showing a membrane in front of the IOL, behind the IOL. So management becomes very much easy when you have an access to UBM. This is one of our case where uh, it was operated for a lens aspiration elsewhere, where it came with a very thick after cataract. So it was a uh, uh, one of the again one of the toughest challenges which we see in our uh, pediatric uh, age group. uh see the amount of after cataract left behind the surgeon has just done a central small opening so i need to use my all my instruments excess uh, scissors micro scissors micro forceps the central round block literally had to be cut and uh, removed as the one uh, ring like i was telling it looks like a tenoid ring but uh, it causes so much of stress on the zonules so we need to be watchful in dissecting it all these degrees very carefully and uh, at the end of surgery we were able to implant a lens in this eye because one lucky thing in this case was there is a lot of lot of after cataract which is not the right thing to do happen in this case but then at least it gave me a chance to you can see the 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 calcified uh, after cataract lens material that's not easy to be aspirated through the i, I had to tease it out into the aspiration port and it just sort of finally the whole uh, 
loosen it up it's it it, it uh, it's an edited video this sort of surgeries may take even one hour one and a half hours two hours because we need to do a very meticulous uh, surgical planning and uh, ultimately i had to i, I remember you uh, using four side ports because just see i have done four ports here one here one here one here because ampedextrically i need to roll around all the 60 degrees in this this i2 ultimately successfully remove this uh, central thick band very thick band to be very frank and then went in for an ivl cyst also in this case successfully the child had a developed a nystagmus but at least the recovery will be was far better the dental attachment uh, we never leave behind any uh, strand in the wound that's one thing we should always say endothelmitis risk is very low is as low as 0, 0 to 0.45% as per this article but then we treat the potential predisposing systemic conditions preoperative evaluation of ocular retinas is very very important and proper sterilization techniques more important than in adult cataracts optimizing operative conditions reduce complications surgery duration and use of intracameral antibiotics secondary rivals we can keep on talking a lot about it secondary esophagus and all those things but it's not beyond the scope of this particular thing but it is possible by doing a good surgical technique oct now as giving a lot of insight so so oct shows serial imaging of choroid which gives us a lot of idea regarding the post operative myopic shift high resolution oct result helps in iol calculation and vaulting of iol which we may not be aware of because we may think the iol is placed properly in the back but because of irregular contracture and decentration within the within the bag itself it gives us a lot of idea regarding how to manage them is an advances nothing much to be uh, highlighted about but then i read an article about uh, a prenatal orbital region ultrasound but not much of uh, able to diagnose much but then there is a lot of research going in that side myopic shift we have to face it we have to face it axial length elongation first to 6 months is 0.62 mm per month in infantile till 18 months phase it's 0.19 mm juvenile phase it, it starts coming down corneal flattening you know it the, the cornea is very steep at birth and it becomes flatter and flatter as he, as the age grows by and it's somewhere around the lens power is somewhere around 35 diopters or so when they are in infant size it, it, it reduces down to the power of 18 to 20 this is a graph to, graph to show that by age of 2 to 3 the uh, the axial length uh, is a tremendous change in the axial length and the flattening of the cornea and we undercorrect there's a lot of formulas on this and proper uh, selection of glasses in afik children with afikia the temple and uh, frame selection the bridge of the frame should be properly confirm the child's nose should not fall down strap the strap the uh, child uh, with the frame on the uh, back of the head and proper this is a very very important rehabilitation because in afikia this this gives a goes a long way and in school going age group prescribe bifocal lenses and follow them periodically for the maintenance of glasses if there's any scratches or damage immediately change them and contact lenses of course in unilateral cataract cases not that easy and uh, amblyopia management if if required yes if it is bilateral most of the time it may not be if it is unilateral yes patch according to the age depend on the depth of amblyopia so that's it uh, i gave a oversight of uh... awesome sir uh, it's a wonderful. Too vast a topic, but still, I try to uh, give it a comprehensive coverage. I... Yes, sir. You have done. You have done justice, perfect justice to the topic, sir. In fact, all our postgraduates have this as a full question. They sat through this uh, uh, forty minutes of your time. They can write that full question very thoroughly. They can even. That was, that was and, in my mind because uh, many times uh, most canal cataracts are all lot of theoretical top, uh, uh, text material. But I, I thought I'll try to give them a clinical touch because I, when they when they become a practicing yeah. artist, uh, as a professor, you rightly say they know to know the theoretical part of it, but how they are going to manage, how they are going to evaluate the right. finer points like uh, keeping the other eye to avoid exposure keratitis in anesthesia. I I had a very unusual situation where a urological they forgot to tape the uh, tape the cornea. The child came to be with bilateral exposure keratitis. So. So these sort of uh, complications which we are not aware of, and keeping the cornea moist, that is more important. Yeah. The evaluation and how to position them with the minimal instruments, basic manual keratometer, 
basic uh, instruments we can always do except for this one or two micro instruments that's it and yes. giving them the confidence my 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 thought is always when whenever there's a pediatric carrot management we say only an expert adult carrot surgeon can do yes i accept that but then how are we to give a momentum to the youngster saying that everyone can do it that's the only thing i tell my fellows is practice doing rexes in all type of cataracts attempt at least once you attempt you you realize that you your hand becomes more and more stable and be ambidextrous i always use my right and left hand both i i never use my dexes in only one hand even in adult cases that all my fellows know so that has given the real confidence in doing a rexes in a child so once they do it in a yeah. young adult then they realize that yes they can also do so the idea behind yes. what i'll say is any listening post graduate or younger ophthalmologist if you are a, a decent carat surgeon in adult carat surgery you are good in handling your micro rexes forceps it's a matter of time in a situation where you cannot refer the patient to your expert you yourself can perform a pediatric cataract yes yes in fact in nhm the rbsk rbsk program in every district has a huge line list of pediatric cataract it's only in fact it is our responsibility as uh, as uh, tnoa members we we'll have to create a mechanism that we generate a pool of pediatric cataract surgeons in the all the districts across the districts yes. even children might not be able to go to the nearest city to get a good uh, cataract surgery done it should be available at least at a zonal level thoroughly with all the refinement and the surgeon should dedicate themselves to pediatric cataract uh, it it is a big ball game different ball game than adult cataract at this time frame of life you can count me on i am the first person to join it i am for the campaign yeah yes sir yes sir we should we should create that we should create that yes sir and we have some questions sir yeah, one question is very interesting uh spacing spacing both eyes cataract spacing yeah. how does ramesh do it how does dr ramesh do it see there there has always been a debate nowadays like uh, we, we during the peak corona cni we had this uh, talk about simultaneous adult carat surgery yeah adult is totally different because uh, all all the uh, allied panel members will accept it because we know the precision what we are going to get post operatively and we can always uh, do a set two separate procedures and uh, we we do lot of adult cataract surgery simultaneous so we do a one surgery the patient goes out and the whole set everything is uh, scrap everything is changed and after half an hour the patient comes in and the totally new set the challenge in a in a pediatric age group is how far the as i was rightly saying about that the andre chamber reactions and such things many times it doesn't happen but if it happens it could be bilateral by you, you can even induce an amblyopia following a thick membrane so it so yeah. a lot of things are beyond our control so never ever i think even jayendra also support me never ever do a simultaneous cataract surgery in a child at all maybe the argument will be is yes the moment you do one eye nice surgery excellent surgery the rivalry starts as sir was telling before this eye starts seeing clearly the other eye starts suppressing badly at least i'll say uh, a big gap I, i prefer doing it in a big gap i type i know that my eye is very quiet unless maybe a surgery like an after cataract like that it is a bilateral case i i done recently i will be waiting for a few more time because already the amblyopia set in this got nystagmus i don't want any inflammation in the eye the eye is quiet free of any inflammatory membrane a uh, big time is a safe i i'll say my hand safe because the anesthetic risk are now very minimal very minimal yes yeah, sir and my personal question here when you are going for a next eye in a week yes, will you modify the eye oil after doing a refraction on this eye which you have done is the eye oil power modified from the learning of the previous eye do we do that sir i think do i think you do that the question has a reasonable answer in that certainly yes see uh, i don't think any expert uh, in pediatric cataract can predict the uh, refractive outcome in a child the same similar situation they may have a plus 5 one one may have a plus 3 so over a period of times in our hands what is going to be the myopic shift we, we start undercorrecting it and as the rashir professor rightly said when one eye is surgery is done and we have something like a, a plus 5 hypermetrope and if we think as a surgeon like i always have a back of the mind hypermetrope is again an amblyogenic factor yeah 
there are myopia that that is always there in the pediatric ophthalmic spine so i'll think why not i just make it less hypermetropic so that can always be done i, I think it is justified yes yeah yes sir yes sir in fact the thumb rule is to make plus 4 with the age that is that is what the thumb rule says for ivl calculation but most of the times I, our mind doesn't accept that we want it to be more towards hemetropic probably it is an us to make it more hemetropic and uh, tripan blue sir you 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 didn't use it in the micro rexus case one question is uh, will you use tripan blue and do you use tripan blue closer to the equator you do you push equatorial tripan blue to get the post capsule also stained one question sir. i i remember, I remember reading one article wherein uh, they tried staining the posterior capsule after removing the lens aspiration visco aspiration before doing a posterior rexus uh, inject tripan blue and then put an air bubble wait for some time uh, to be very frank i just tried it in one case but i didn't find any big difference in okay. an anterior rexus in a zonular cataract i'll uh, tell you you just try this uh, rim as a marker and you have a good microscope with a zoom fully on you have an excellent rexus but if it is a total cataract sometimes in a lobular cataract and uh, there are some a lot of white, white irregular uh, blocks certainly staining is very very important it has to be done a little bit more time than an adult because that's what i found my experience there is some sort of uneven staining i don't know reasons why maybe in a minute there's a lot of blocks or calcifications it's very irregular so need to give some extra few seconds more that's it but posterior yes, rexus, posterior rexus i think unless if we have a block i i do have a lot of videos to share i had a we have a block right over the center like a ring like thing here but clear posterior rexus only thing is you need to really perfectly focus on uh, that you will be able to focus only after you make, take a cystito and you, you, as if like floating in a free free air you make a puncture yeah. you see a small round opening that will be the key point focus on the round opening then start doing your exercise done yeah. yes sir and another question is main port suturing yes do the side ports also need to be sutured <laughs> uh, if, it's a, if it's an infant, you, you just uh, carefully uh, see the egress of fluid once you finish the surgery, and maybe we can zoom in on the on the side port. By the even though it is not a multiple frequent in in and out of instruments, there will be some amount of fish mouthing of the wound, one of them wound also. What was said that we are making a one of them opening in an infant's eye. So when they rub, uh, that why why it is extra risk because. i always bury my knots and uh, i make it a bit tight because invariably over a period of months it's going to get looser and nothing happened just put a mask suture removal is very simple affair we don't have to go for intubation at all and never any harm felt and uh, we are minimizing the risk of uh, second time taking into the or for anesthesia and the risk of hypotony and uh, i i feel it's safe maybe a grown up kid over a period of 5 years of above when i operated on zonular cataract with grown up kid i like an adult i the side ports i just try to do a stromal hydration i press on the cornea if i am very convinced i just finish yeah. with the main one yes. yeah yeah posterior pressure is a challenge posterior pressure the, the pc tends to come up and bulge what uh, do you how do you handle it uh, the the question asked is about the uh, uh, vitreous thrust so we are yeah. here uh, unlike an adult it's a, it's a solid vitreous Yes. so even before you uh, the moment you enter into the anterior chamber by your side port only unlike uh, if in an adult cataract when you when you do a side port entry you realize that the chamber is stable unless you go inside and let the aqueous out but here the moment you take the uh, uh, my experience when you take the side port inside and at, at the time of release yeah, side port only the the aqueous comes out you see a bit of collapse uh, thrust yeah. only thing is uh, as my mentor always said always have the best of the ocular uh, viscoelastics cohesive because they yeah. really really push and flatten it and it is very very important because unless you have that you cannot do a perform a good rexus that take my take my value so even i'll say uh, coming to the scenario of uh, cost factor like there is like i wrote nhm i also have I've had a feel of it and uh, when it is a cost factor i feel uh, you uh, people sitting in the top bracket at least should 
uh, give them the value of getting the that right oclo uh, 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 elastic just for this case alone that yeah. is not a big deal because without that i think it's going to be a trouble because, it's going to be tough because uh, when we are not doing any compromise adult carrier surgery but then when when i have a rexus break and i put a lens focus my mind doesn't get upset in an adult cataract I, I i put a three piece and I, suddenly i launch put a single piece and i put a three piece and the sulcus my my mind does not upset but a child cataract unless if it is 100% in the back you are not covered yeah so only option is uh, uh, having a good uh, pressure given by yeah. the yeah yeah but, yeah. but, but uh, take my word my experience i have done some zone lock attacks purely with hhpmc purely that doesn't mean that you have to always depend upon this uh, progressive viscoelastics no certain so zone lock attacks beyond the age of 5 or 6 case by case you analyze if you think you are have a two tight side ports you are going to perform your rexus only through that hpmc alone without a bubble it will do it also trust me you can yeah do. yeah yes sir and anesthesia anesthesia you uh, tanesthetis wants will dr ramesh also block will he give a block to keep the anesthesia shallow um in in a pediatric cataract maybe in a in a strabismus there is always a discussion going on the oclo cardiac reflex but uh, here there's a need for a block it's going to make the uh, tenons uh, bulging very tight go to yeah. make more uh, cumbersome and uh, a, a proper anesthesia i don't think there's a need for a block at all maybe when they suspect an oclo cardiac reflex then now we have better drugs to combat that i think yeah. even practice is now given off in a squint in a ga so i i don't yeah. feel a need for a block i have never done one to be very frank so you you, you i think dr mohan rajan sir is calling jayanthan just call mr and ask him i think mr is calling okay sir i last jayanthan just help me no just i keep asking dr yes. ramesh and yes. uh, yeah the next question sir uh, is post aphakia secondary eye oil your view sir uh, uh, i had few experience of uh, doing uh, rigid lenses less than 6 months yeah Yeah, no, no. Post post aphakia, second eye oil will be. You not... purposefully leave. I think the question means yeah. you leave them aphakic. Yeah. You leave them aphakic, and yeah. you plan a second eye oil. When do you do that? What are the uh, good tip, good practices? The learning curve was very shallow in the initial days. I think I was waiting for a long period. Now the 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 video I showed was a, a two and a half year old operated elsewhere for just aphakia. It came to me. So I had the I had the. Uh, that's to go out and do and put in a get the get the bag opened up and put in a three piece foldable lens i am more comfortable with the foldable lens especially single piece acrisop lenses because of the lens yeah. model and design and secondary eye oil as they grow older now i think we as surgeons also accept that uh, beyond 8 to 10 years of age even you can do a good scleral fixation lens also yeah but there are no other contra indications so uh, but no experience on uh, iris clip lens certainly no But not it has to be again open up the leaflets, the scarring, and then go ahead and do. And because see, when we operate something like I have a few cases of a fibrous cataract, what happens invariably is the the central leaflets gets gets crushed. In. The periphery is like a fusiform bulge, like you saw in the Sartor cataract. That yeah. is my observation. So in that case, if we're able to open up that central uh, thick blocker rim, we're left with the donut donut like uh, capsular bag. So and I have have done very few with eye zoops also in a in the myotic people. It's a very tough thing, but then I have took my effort and uh, does that. Once we the real challenge is if you are able to do a rexus and create a back type of cataract or a period of experience, it's always uh, nice to put in there. But I'll uh, to the question will be probably a uh, back uh, secondary eye oil. The previous surgery has been done beautifully. Or else don't worry about the. Bag at all, go wait. Uh, Rehabilitation of the topic is after ten years of age. Then finally, thorough peripheral retinal evaluation. No, no other comorbid anatomy like uh, glaucoma or uh, any corneal pathology. I feel SFI will be a good choice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I am personally awed by the two points which you said, sir. 
along with we scan ubm sir so uh, ubm will give lot of clues and also that under microscope examination under microscope absolutely not to uh, not to even post operatively because i may look very quiet no sir yeah. i will yeah. be looking purely white surprisingly put them under microscope after surgery you have a thin membrane that is very dangerous it becomes intense so intensely start dilating them and put steroids they become all right so under person microscope true sir true sir i think those are the two take home points i will take awesome awesome class jayanthan from your side any more questions jayanthan will have lot of questions jayanthan <laughs> <laughs> is a, a all round star <laughs> ah yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> the most <laughs> happening surgeon <laughs> in Tamil Nadu, Jayant. Or or Doni Mari, or or. Ah, Doni Mari, correct. <laughs> Jayant, choice of suture, sir. Pardon? Choice of suture. Tenno nylon, Jayant. Just tenno nylon. Never try tenno vicryl. Uh, maybe I've seen glaucoma surgeons using tenno vicryl in the flap, but never, never done in one in a pediatric cat track for reasons. for maybe my age experience i i think i'll stick to that maybe i can try it in some grown up children to see how this uh, tenno vicryl behaves maybe i can give a feedback but always tenno nylon is very safe i've been doing it for years and most surgeons are doing that nothing only things you have to remove it that's all for a two months treatment yeah. because in may be gets loosened uh, there again uh, rashe sir when whenever you see a child post operatively you can carefully watch that the suture area becomes loose and they'll show some sort of deposits if they are ignored they can be a source of a suture tract infection so yeah. again highlighting the uh, value of seeing through microscope yes microscope yeah. yes sir true sir true you can consider the and have a look it's not difficult yeah. no need to yeah. ask yeah. yeah yeah yes sir even rop we are seeing even rop we are seeing till the periphery so this is very easy you can even bring an old microscope to the to the examination center even out of the out of the theater in the, yeah. in the block room or the recovery room you know that we go yeah. into or it can be just so yeah. yes just yes, a true sir are you close and just see yeah true jayanth sir that's it sir great talk sir nice compilations you made it very simple sir yeah, yeah. correct uh, i correct. should uh, uh, shivani come yeah. come come uh, she is my fellow uh to be very frank i just gave her a complete <laughs> story and she only made it all the presentation and work is mine but then uh, she did all the compilation so it's a it's yeah. a much and uh, rashe sir uh, once again i am telling i am now this time frame in my life i am very passionate about kanjal carat management so any anywhere any any task force if you want me you can always use me yeah 100% sir 100% yes and sir true sir not no monetary, monetary interest at all whatever yes sir task for kanjal yes, carat ama illa illa this pediatric cataract i am sure all pediatric cataract sir surgeons are very committed and uh, more altruistic aims are uh, not there yeah so that that much is that sir 100% any uh, we are missing mr we are missing mr mr would have cracked two jokes by now and made this <laughs> discussion very lovely I, I, i think he is caught between bihar and uh, and uh, and jharkhand i think <laughs> my son dr prasan i think most of you know So you yeah, 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 always yeah. uh, compare me with him now initially. Then he, uh, then he, then he said he cannot change Abba. So I said this said Amar sir is Amar. <laughs> one and only Amar sir. No one can mimic correct. him. <laughs> correct, correct, true sir, true Everyone sir. Everyone has got an individuality and personality. So we yeah, 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 yeah. And he is a very yeah. level person. Yeah, true, true. More than more than anything, sir, the energy levels, the vibration they bring, and their presence in a. area creates huge difference in any discussion plus or minus mr will make a huge difference yeah, yeah. closing before before closing uh, pradeep sharma sir uh, i i just it's not a exaggeration just uh, uh, just be along with them itself will make you learn uh, that, yeah right uh, of an amazing teacher and yeah. christmas i don't think you can get anyone better than <laughs> yeah in fact the definition of a teacher is to inspire and make people learn not even necessary to teach them on every point i can tell you ninga unga pgs la final year mudikumbodhu inno rendu session avarthu paathanga na by the session session aayiruvaanga nijama yeah correct <laughs> yeah no <laughs> sir inspiring a irukku na i will i will be happy if i can make a minimal impact in kanyal cataract in my lifetime yes sir yes sir true sir true sir wonderful so jayanthan vote of thanks on the top <laughs> Uh, sorry, I spoke to him. 
மோகன்ராஜன் சார் ஆல்சோ இஸ் நாட் ரீச்சிங் ஆல் அவரோட சிக்னல் வந்து ரொம்ப வீக்கா இருக்கறதனால ஹீ டோல் யா அதா சார் அதா thank you sir it's a great privilege to tell the vote of thanks uh, for this wonderful session so first of all i would like to thank our uh, master trainers dr ramesh sir dr pradeep sharma sir uh, definitely it's a wonderful i felt like i'm hearing audio book of his uh, strabismus yeah. simplified uh, book we are read it we are hearing it for the first time and uh, definitely Uh, Ramesh sir has made the whole lot of congenital cataract more practical and by just seeing his uh, videos i think uh, any general ophthalmologist can uh, do a pediatric cataract uh, so thank you so much for making it so simplified sir and uh, definitely uh, the next thanks goes to our uh, president mohan rajan sir for uh, uh, making the show uh, act live and uh, uh, rajshekar sir the arc chairman of uh, dnoa uh i know sir has taken so much of effort for making this more practical for the post graduates and definitely it is taking it to a uh, next level and uh, the webinars what we conduct is definitely reaching more people because uh, live session can actually cater to only a very small population and uh, thanks to the milman who are supporting the webinars in all the way for our tno uh thanks to the management committee members who have joined us the secretary madhavan sir uh, treasurer lokanathan sir management committee ma- member uh, dr ravi shankar sir so thanks to everyone it was a wonderful evening uh, well learned and well uh, understood about the pediatric ophthalmology uh, thank you so much sir thank you super thanks one and all vanakkam thank you sir huge learning today ramesh sir thank you the the mutual for you and for pradeep sharma sir i, I just called pradeep sharma sir immediately said yes yeah. yes yes